In this video, I'm going to talk about the do's and the don'ts of intermittent fasting when you hit perimenopause. So if you're a woman in her late 30s, early 40s, mid 40s, and you've just gained weight out of nowhere, you're not doing anything different with your nutrition or your workouts, this video is for you. Hello, I am Tina Hoppert. I am the woman behind the Carrots and Cake brand. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Here you will hear me talk about nutrition and lifestyle and fitness and hormones and weight loss and metabolism and so much more. In today's video, I am going to talk about the do's and don'ts of intermittent fasting in perimenopause. Perimenopause is definitely a special time in a woman's life, but a lot of things don't feel like they used to. And basically what you did in your 20s is not going to work nowadays. So tune in, listen to the details here and get started on your fasting journey. So perimenopause, like I mentioned, very special time in our lives. <laughs> Hormones are changing, they're slowing down, but basically what is happening is our bodies are becoming less resilient to stress. And when our stress is out of whack or we're constantly stressed or we're not dealing well with stress, our cortisol levels are going to raise. And when our cortisol levels raise, that's our stress hormone, our glucose is going to raise and that is our blood sugar. And so if you're somebody who has gained weight, you don't know why you're gaining weight, you're not able to lose weight, it's all about making sure that blood sugar is balanced. And intermittent fasting can be a really helpful way to help you lose weight and keep it off. Of course, it's one tool of many when it comes to fat loss, but it's a great way to maintain your health, practice some boundaries as far as an eating window goes, and really help you lose weight and keep it off. When it comes to fat loss in general, there are three ways or three methods of restriction. And it really is all about picking the restriction that works best for you. I have really fallen in love with intermittent fasting because this type of restriction works for me. It's time restriction. It puts some boundaries around when I am eating and not eating, and it's really been helpful for me. So that's one type of restriction, time restriction. The second is calorie restriction. I think that's the typical diet that most most women go on, like you restrict your calories, you lose weight. I think there's good and bad things about it. I mean, restricting calories too, too much for too long can really mess with your hormones and metabolism. I'll talk about that and how it fits within intermittent fasting. And the third type of restriction is really eliminating certain food groups and types of foods. So like keto or a whole 30 or paleo or low carb diet or gluten-free or dairy-free or whatever you wanna do as far as restriction goes. So I think when it comes to fat loss and getting to your goal weight, it really is about finding what type of restriction works best for you. Okay, so let's jump right into this as far as the do's and don'ts of intermittent fasting with your perimenopause hormone state in mind. Do number one, <laughs> track your cycle. So in perimenopause, yes, things are going to change a lot. Your periods are either gonna get shorter, they're gonna get longer. Things are just gonna get a little weird as far as your menstrual cycle goes. So the sooner you can start tracking when it's coming, your symptoms, everything that goes along with it, the better. Because as you progress through perimenopause, things are gonna get weirder and weirder and more and more irregular. And the thing about perimenopause, it can last anywhere from four to eight years, even as long as 10 years. So you really wanna get your ducks in a row as far as knowing your body, understanding the symptoms, um, and just understanding what's happening to your hormones throughout the month. I'm a fan of pen and paper as far as tracking what's going Going on with my cycle and symptoms, you know, how many days a cycle is, all that good stuff. So pen and paper is totally fine. There's a ton of apps out there. There's the Clue app. There's various apps that work with the Apple Watch or a ring. There's a million ways to track your cycle if you're into the apps and the technology and all that. And then finally, you can track your symptoms. I think that's a really good way to understand what's going on with your body. And really, it's all about getting to know your body and listening to your body because the more information and data you have about what your hormones are doing throughout the cycle, the better you're able to make changes and to feel better and to optimize this intermittent fasting. So tracking your cycle is really 
fundamental. It might seem a little boring and maybe not something at the top of your list, but I promise you, if you start doing it, you will get to know your body better and better and it will make this transition so much easier. Do number two is to make sure you're eating enough calories. So like I mentioned in the beginning, as far as restriction goes, you can absolutely use intermittent fasting as a way to restrict calories. Obviously you're shortening your eating window. So you are eating fewer calories during that time period that can help with fat loss. But if you were somebody who is interested in building muscle, having that tone look, you know, being strong and healthy, I don't think you need to reduce your calories so, so much. So sometimes these like longer fasts might be a little too much for your body right now. Um, so I would make sure you're eating enough calories during that short window and really making sure you're eating enough protein because that is so important for building muscle and then also maintaining muscle. And if you're somebody who has come to intermittent fasting under eating, under eating even more is going to slow your metabolism even more and cause you to plan plateau even more with your results. So this is to say, make sure you are eating enough in that shortened window. So it might need, might mean making your meals a little bit bigger, adding an extra snack. Um, there's lots of ways to make sure you're getting enough calories. I do think sometimes tracking your food as far as tracking your calories, tracking your macros, things like that can be really important to make sure you're eating enough because yeah, under eating is not going to be the best way to lose weight if you are not optimizing your hormones and what you are doing with your metabolism. The third do that I have for you is make sure your food quality is the highest possible because yeah, sure, you can do the intermittent fasting thing, but if you're eating a bunch of crap and processed food and fake sugars and everything, it's not gonna get you the best result. I mean, if you're putting junk into your body, I just think it's going to come out that way as far as what you see on the external. So make sure you're including good quality sources of protein, fiber, whole foods as much as possible. If it's available, go for the organic option, the grass fed, the non-GMO, the better quality, the better. I mean, I know it's hard to find these things, they're more expensive, but when you have the option, I say go for the better, higher quality option. Your body just uses those foods differently. And then you're also not dealing with all the chemicals and the pesticides and the glyphosate and all the things that go into some of that processed food. So it's all about just treating your body well. Remember this do, keep it in mind. And when you were grocery shopping every week, make sure 80% of your grocery cart is whole foods, the good healthy stuff that doesn't come in a package or a box. And 20% could be the fun stuff, but the majority of what you were buying every single week is from the perimeter of the grocery store, the meats, the fish, the fruits, the veggies, the good whole dairy, all the good stuff. So keep that in mind when you are putting together your grocery shopping list every week. Speaking of your grocery shopping list, this brings me to the next do. So this is something I tell my clients, this is something I personally do, is that you should plan your grocery shopping list around your cycle, <laughs> your menstrual cycle. And I know this probably sounds a little crazy, a little out there, but if you have the right foods in your house, it's gonna make it so much easier for you to eat for your hormones. And I'm gonna give a quick little shout out right now for an awesome freebie that can help you with this. I have a hormonal health meal plan that really helps you figure out what to buy and what half your cycle and how to incorporate these foods into different recipes and meals and things like that. So it's literally a follicular phase plan for the first half of your cycle and a luteal phase for the second half of your cycle. It gives you a grocery shopping list as far as what to buy in each half of your cycle. So check that out, I'll include it in the notes. It's totally free, download it and bring it to the grocery store with you. So planning your grocery shopping list around your cycle. So let me give you the short and sweet version of this. So in the first half of your cycle from day one of your period until ovulation, that's when estrogen is starting to grow as far as increasing in your body. So when insulin is high, you become less sensitive to insulin. So this is where you're going to want to have the largest 
fasting windows um, in your cycle as far as timing goes. This is where you might want to do the traditional 16-8 fast, but this is also where you probably want to keep carbohydrates a little bit moderate. And this doesn't mean no carb. Carbohydrates are great. And especially if you're somebody who is exercising regularly, you want to build muscle, you need to make sure you have some sort of carbohydrates in your diet. But this is where I would kind of keep those levels on the lower side, just because your body isn't as sensitive to insulin during this time period. So this is where intermittent fasting can come into play and really work in your benefit. And what I also tell women is if you want to try to start this intermittent fasting stuff, start it, you know, day three of your period, it's going to feel a lot easier starting intermittent fasting during a time when your hormones are low versus, you know, the week before your period where all sorts of stuff is happening, getting your body ready for menstruation. You're going to be a lot hungrier during that period versus the first half of your cycle. So just a little tip, pro tip. <laughs> if you want to try this, start in the first half of your cycle, you know, within a few days um, of your period is probably fine. And then how to plan your groceries for the second half of your cycle. This is where your body really does need some carbohydrates. So you need to support progesterone. Progesterone needs a little bit of glucose um, to make sure it is supported in that second half of the cycle. So it's important to make sure you do not go super low carb in the second half of your cycle. This is also where your intermittent fasting window might be a little bit shorter. So I like to tell clients, and this is what I personally do, 12 hour fast. I feel like that's a good place to be. I mean, you could go up to 13 or 14, somewhere in there. It really depends on you and how your body feels, but a shorter fasting window is probably a little bit better here. So if you eat dinner at seven o'clock, you won't eat breakfast till seven o'clock the next day. And I think that's a good amount of time to let your digestive system rest and digest, but of course, feel it out. I mean, it's really about what works best for you, but this is where I would not go low carb as far as what you were eating and what to add to your grocery shopping list would be slow digesting, low glycemic carbohydrates. And what I mean by that is carbohydrates that have a good amount of fiber that will slow that blood sugar spike. So my favorites are beans and lentils, um, different types of berries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, different squashes, um, acorn squash, butternut squash, whatever squash you like, um, carrots, parsnips, other root vegetables, plums, grapefruit. If you need more of a list, <laughs> definitely check out my freebie as far as that hormonal health meal plan. Um, and then also you can do a quick Google for slow digesting, low glycemic carbohydrates. It'll give you a whole list of things to add, but really just want to emphasize this is not the time to go low carb. And I think a lot of women experience PMS cravings and they feel a lot hungrier in the second half of the cycle. So this is me giving you permission to lean into those cravings and not to under eat. And actually, you know, if you are not doing a lot of intermittent fasting in the second half of your cycle, you might not feel like you're making progress progress towards your goal or you're not losing weight, but remember you are actually supporting your body and supporting your hormones. So, you know, fasting in this way and eating in this way might actually benefit your goals in the long run because you're not stressing out your body and you're giving it what it needs. So even though you're not fasting as much in the second half of the cycle, don't feel like you're not making progress. The next do I have for you is to be flexible and listen to your body. So. With intermittent fasting, yes, you are setting some boundaries for you as far as that eating window goes, but you don't need to white knuckle it to noon or something like that. I have been there, I have done that. And I was doing the traditional 16-8 and I remember feeling awful in the morning, like lightheaded, low energy, kind of cranky. And I literally white knuckled it to noon just so I could eat within that shortened eating window. And I, oh, I just felt so bad. So this is me to tell you, if you are hungry, 
eat. <laughs> and so like my eating window a lot of times is I stop eating around seven and then I won't eat until 10 or 11 in the morning. And you know, if I'm hungry at night, I'll have a snack. If I'm hungry first thing in the morning, I'll eat breakfast. So really it's all about listening to your body. Like you don't have to white knuckle it. You don't have to be miserable. And if your body and your biofeedback is saying, I'm starving, I'm miserable, I have low blood sugar, I'm lightheaded, I'm cranky, eat. <laughs> like you don't have to be miserable doing this intermittent fasting stuff. And of course, if you're somebody that wants to do this intermittent fasting stuff, start slow. Start with a 12 hour fast, do that for a week, move it up to 13 hours, move it to 14 hours. You can go slowly and slowly increase that eating window or decrease that eating window, but do it slowly and in a way that supports your body and where you feel good doing it. Like this fasting stuff should not feel miserable. Like you should not struggle through it. It shouldn't be crazy. I mean, of course you might be a little hungry at times, but it shouldn't be so hungry that you are having other physical symptoms. And finally, my last do is to prioritize strength training. <laughs> I think this is so, so important. And if you're somebody who wants to lose weight and keep it off, strength training is such a good way to optimize your blood sugar balance and being more sensitive to those carbohydrates and different foods that you're consuming. And then building muscle is going to change how your body composition looks. And a lot of us want that toned fit look. And if you don't have muscle under your skin and fat, you are not going to have that look. So it's really important to build muscle. And as we age, it gets harder and harder to build muscle because our hormones are slowing down. We don't have all those amazing hormones that that we had in our 20s. So as I tell my clients, you gotta use it or you're going to lose it. So if you are not doing a strength training program right now, I would hop on it sooner than later. And what I tell my clients, especially the beginners, you know, plan two or three strength training workouts per week, start there and just be consistent with it. Don't feel like you have to work out five or six days a week to see some progress. Do two or three quality strength training workouts every single week and just be consistent week after week. And the other great thing about building muscle is the more muscle you have on the, your body, the more receptors you have as far as insulin goes. And this makes you more sensitive to all the different blood sugar things that are going on in your body. And if you're somebody who is gaining weight or having trouble gaining weight, especially in perimetopause, blood sugar is so, so important. Or just being aware of your blood sugar and making sure it's not too high and not too low, um, but really that blood sugar balance is so, so important right now. And strength training can really help optimize it. Okay, here we go. Let's do the don'ts now. These are the things to not do when you were trying this intermittent and fasting stuff when you're in these perimetopause years. So number one is do not under eat. I know I already wrote this into the do's as far as what to do is to eat enough, but don't under eat. This is so, so important because you do not want to lose muscle. Like if you have built muscle, it's all about maintaining it. So making sure you're eating enough calories, especially protein. And then also you don't want to stress out the body by under eating. I mean, that is going to drive up cortisol and then the fat is not going to come off. I mean, really under eating is going to slow your metabolism. It's basically doing the opposite of what you want to do. So this is all about eating enough. <laughs> to fuel your body and to fuel your activity. The second don't that I have for you is to not go super low carbohydrate with your calorie consumption if you are somebody who exercises regularly. If you're somebody who's exercising three, four, five, six times a week, you need carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are our body's preferred energy source in the sense that it's really easy for our bodies to burn them. Um, and if you are doing physical activity, you need carbohydrates to fuel that activity and to recover from it. So don't go super duper low carb um, and don't go low carb in that second half of your cycle. That week before your period and that time after ovulation, you need carbohydrates and glucose to support the progesterone that your body has produced after ovulation. So remember, don't eat super low carb in that second half of your cycle. You also might have a lot more cravings. You might be more hungry. So this is where you should load up on those slow digesting 
um, low glycemic carbohydrates that I mentioned before. The next don't I have for you involves exercise. And so that week before your period, don't go crazy with the high intensity exercise because this week before your period, like your body is really getting ready for menstruation. You know, different things are happening with your hormones and this is where you don't want to stress out your body. Like you really want to be more low key with your activity. This is where you would add in walking or yoga or Pilates. You could probably do some strength training here. I just wouldn't do like the high intensity, super heavy lifting. Um, you could, it really depends on how your body feels, but if you're feeling less energetic, less motivated, it's totally normal to feel that way that week before your period. So don't feel bad about yourself. Don't berate yourself for not having the energy and motivation to do your normal workouts. Just accept it and be okay with it. And remember, your body is doing a lot of different things. It needs a lot of energy. And it's okay for you to be a little bit more chill as far as your workouts go. Maybe sit on the couch more, relax a little bit more. I think that is all really good because you are supporting your hormones. You're not stressing out your body. And even though it seems a little counterintuitive to do less high intensity exercise in this part of your menstrual cycle, especially when you're trying to lose weight, you actually might benefit your body and you might see better results in the long run. So that's my next don't. Don't go crazy with the high intensity exercise. And what I mean by high intensity exercise here is you know, going for like a really long run or doing like a 45 minute Peloton ride or going to Orange Theory or something like that. Shout out for my very first video, why I quit Orange Theory. <laughs> <laughs> Check that video out. But that type of exercise really dries up our cortisol levels and we're really trying to keep them down that week before our period. And then finally, my last don't is don't think that intermittent fasting is a magic pill for weight loss and all the things that you want it to do. It really is just one tool in your tool bag as far as fast lots goes. So again, it's one type of restriction that you are using. You also need to remember food quality is really important. The amount of sleep that you're getting, stress management, strength training, like all of the foundations are so, so important. So really this is just me to say, don't put all your eggs in one basket as far as intermat intermittent fasting being the magic bullets that's gonna help you lose weight and gain strength and look amazing. It's just one piece of the puzzle. It can be really, really helpful. I have found a lot of success with it. I feel really good. I have lost weight, so I'm a big fan of it. But just remember, it's not the only thing that you should be doing and it's not a magic pill. So if this video resonated with you, I said a lot of interesting things. I have you thinking about how you eat and fast and exercise. I have an intermittent fasting and hormonal health cheat sheet that lays it all out for you, your, the different phases of your menstrual cycle, what your fasting window should be in each of those phases, and then how to exercise and the types of foods to eat. It really makes all of this so much easier. So download it. The link is in the notes. It's totally free, and I really think it will help be helpful to you. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would love for you to take a second to like it and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss more of this intermittent fasting, perimetopause, hormone information.